This morning I found out that my social team posted a graphic on my Instagram yesterday that said, Still I Rise. That is obviously an immortal line from a Maya Angelou poem, only no credit was given to her. While I didn't create or post the graphic, I am the leader of the team that did, and so I accept full responsibility for their actions. She's like, I found out, as if like she had no idea this happened. I just, I just found it out. I was just made aware of it. I just, I just stumbled across the fact. I didn't do it. My employees who work for me, who I pay to do these things for me, did it. I'd heard a lot of rumors that the social media person who had been responsible for posting it had gotten let go of the company. So that, that was true. That did happen. That did happen? Is it true? This is another thing I heard. Is it true that the person who was let go was a woman of color? Yes. RC, whose actual name is Rachel, but when I hired her, I said there can only be one of us. Uh, so we changed, literally changed her name to RC. That sounds like Devil Wears Prada. I'm not wrong. I don't know why you're acting like. No, I, I, I struggle. You agree, here's the thing, you agreed to this. We promised this to the customers. Mommy and Daddy still love each other. <laughs> <laughs> this is your concern. You're concerned that's the case, it is expensive. We will lose money is my concern. My concern is it will lose money. It absolutely will be profitable. The biggest thing that is going to get in your way as a couple who works together is ego. I almost said it because I knew you were going to say it. Ego. Humility. Being humble. You have to be humble. What is it about me that made you think I want to be relatable? You are supposed to lead with a servant's heart. You are supposed to have empathy. You are supposed to have vision. You are supposed to care about the people on your team. You are not supposed to know all of the answers. We can't continue to hold a staff at this size without being able to do events. And um, I have, now I want you to know that I've tried, um, sorry, everything. Um, we're gonna take care of you and we're gonna help you find the next thing. After the company-wide meeting, I, I never heard from Rachel about anything. She specifically said like, I will still keep in contact with you. I'll still be here for you guys, but you never heard from her again. No. Totally saw that coming. Who's looking forward to the new self-help book co-written by Rachel Hollis and Ben Shapiro? It's called Didn't See My Girl Coming. Get you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should take up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it. What's up my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy, welcome back to my channel. If you're new, welcome for the first time. This is Savvy Writes Books and on this channel we talk about books and business. I am a small business owner. I run a business called Forever Home Friends that produces books, plushies, and more based on real rescue dogs and their journeys to adoption. And that's why on this channel we delve into the book world and also into the world of entrepreneurship along with the authors and book people out there who are trying to scam entrepreneurs, which is where Rachel Hollis brings it all together. She is just the, the glue that connects all the elements of my channel in a very beautiful and disturbing way. Today's video is one that I've really been wanting to make for a long, long time, and finally the right opportunity came along for that. I guess that life was happening through me. Merch link in description below. But I want to give a quick thank you to the person who reached out to me over email. In my most recent video about Rachel Hollis and the whole mess that's been going on, I mentioned that if anyone had worked for her, or not even just for her, if anyone had worked for any of the business gurus that I cover on this channel, the Grant Cardones, the Tony Robbinses, the Gwyneth Paltrow's, whoever, if you worked, if you've ever worked them, I want to hear your story. And someone reached out to me and said, I used to work for Hollis Company. I want to share my story. And the interview we had was absolutely fantastic. Here's how I really want to frame today's video. And here's what I want the main takeaways for everyone to be. As you guys know, my channel is all about small business support. That's what I'm about as a person, as a small business owner, as a writer. I run a Facebook group for women in business. It's linked below if you want to join. I'm all about uplifting other women in business. And that's, you know, what Rachel says she's about, which is why I read Girl Wash Your Face in the first place, which is what gave my YouTube channel traction in the first place. 
But I've seen how that can be done really wrong when it becomes clear that the end goal was actually furthering that guru's career and them building their platform off of the idea of selling entrepreneurship and selling the dream to you. It's kind of like a pyramid scheme or even more so like how people used to sell shovels in the gold rush. Selling the idea of selling a course on how to sell shovels to other people so that they can be the ones to dig the gold but by the time it gets to them they're the majority of the people and all the gold is gone. It's a pyramid. You guys know what I'm talking about. So the way I want to frame today's video is what we can learn from this as small business owners, as women in business, or if you're watching and you're not a woman in business, what you can learn about maybe a boss that you might be working for or something like that. I want to see what Rachel did wrong in a lot of these circumstances and what that means overall for how we should approach running a small business, running a company, starting up something new, how we should approach these situations when they come about. In the previous video, we talked about how Rachel loves to blame her team for things, how when things go wrong, she says, oh, it was my team that did it. So I wanted to see what it was like to actually be a member of Rachel's team. When this person reached out to me for an interview, she explained to me that one of her goals was to show that the team and the employees and all of the people that work at Hollis Company are incredibly hardworking and devoted and innovative people. One of the things just overall about the company and the mission overall that can, I think gets missed in some of the conversations about it is that people, her followers and the employees right now are so very passionate about like wanting to improve, wanting to be our best selves. And I think that's true of, again, the audience and a lot of the employees. The history of companies and businesses that she has created has not necessarily had a clear line. So the it doesn't seem like the passion has always been entrenched in that. And it seems fairly new to start from event planning to fiction books to cookbooks, to a self-help book that took off and something built off of that, it seems as though it's the company has chased where the money has come from rather than a, a certain passion. Now, I'm not going to reveal what this person's particular role was because she did want to remain anonymous for this and I'm going to respect that. I appreciate that she was willing to do an audio interview with me, so I will not be showing her face during this. However, I will tell you guys that I did verify that this person did legitimately work for Hollis Company until October of 2020 when she was laid off. I was able to verify this through her sending me a LinkedIn page, me matching up her name with that, and then her also showing her face to me on camera camera and me matching up her face with the face on the LinkedIn profile. So it really, th this person really did work for Hollis Company. Please don't speculate about who it is. I care that people feel comfortable talking to me and coming onto my channel. Similar to many of the other videos we've done on various business gurus, I'm going to be breaking this video into a couple different sections. Those sections are going to be toxic positivity, plagiarism, layoffs, the RISE conference, and updates. Before we get too deep into the interview, please don't forget that if you like this type of content, I do have a second channel where every morning at 8 a.m. Central, my friend and I host a morning show live stream podcast where we each live the life of various different business gurus. Rachel Hollis was someone whose morning routine we lived for a week. We've also lived as Grant Cardone, Tony Robbins. So please don't forget to subscribe to my second channel called Your Morning Guru, linked in the description below. This video today was brought to you by my Patreon supporters. Please don't forget to look in the description below because everyone who supports me at $5 a month and up on Patreon has the option to have their own channel or website or small business linked in the description below. So please don't forget to show them some love. They are fantastic small business supporters and so are you for watching this video. Now let's have life happen three us as we delve into the toxic positivity of Hollis Company. And I think, I think there's, there's a lot of like positive intention in things. Um, one of the biggest challenges in terms of like all the projects that we um, worked on as a team was the fact that we would, we were hired for a specific role, but then every time there was a new project, we would kind of switch roles and oh, take okay. leadership in different things, um, even across different departments, um, which did create some challenges. Um, 
things I was specifically hired for, I didn't necessarily work on um, and instead was found in leadership roles on things that I knew I could do, but I didn't have that much experience in, which definitely limited both the time and like quality of the execution of things Mm -hmm. um, with limited resources. So I think even in times where there may have been, you know, people being like, hey, I just want to make sure this team is working on this and you're being cautious of um, of this, you know, this, that and the other. It wasn't because of the scrambling and the limited communication that it unfortunately affected how customers interacted with the things we were we were putting out. And I think um, while movement was a part of every rise, especially for the virtual, like happy and healthy, I wish that was something that was addressed. Um, Just different people's different ability levels in terms of of movement and just like using their body to to change their their mood and mind. Absolutely. And you said something really interesting, which was that you felt like you had to be like part of the in crowd in order to be out or to be yourself or to truly like be the person you are in full. Um, I I wonder like more of what you meant by that. And if there were examples of, you know, why, why you think you or other employees might've felt uncomfortable with embracing who you are fully. Cause you know, Rachel's always saying that every conference, she's like, be your authentic self, show up all the way as your authentic self. But then when you were working at her company, you almost didn't feel comfortable with that. And I'm wondering why that was. Yeah. And I, I mean, for me, like a piece of it is just like my perception of certain things, but Mm -hmm. I do know just how the culture, what I think that, um, the like choose joy piece of it Mm -hmm. was something that kind of, um, brought that on for several people. Um, I think it's known that we had like dance parties every, like whenever we had company wide meetings, (laughs) even when we're working from home, um, but in when we were in the office having those meetings, it was like there was a mix of people who were very into it um, and like most likely very genuinely, you know, like strutting their stuff whenever they were dancing. Um, there were other people who just like didn't dance and that's totally OK. But then there were some others who like dance just to show that, yes, I'm trying to buy into the choose joy um, because it almost felt like if you didn't do those things, you wouldn't be seen as doing what you needed to do for the company and, and um, like participating and things like that. Um, So for me, sometimes I felt fake joining in in certain things like that. Um, And it was really just a hard balance internally of like wanting to fully immerse myself in the company and really feeling like a part of the team, but also feeling like, if I don't want to dance to, I want to dance to somebody on a Monday, it's okay. And that yeah. doesn't mean that I'm a drag. Um, it just means that this isn't my song. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but I think that's like a, a small example of certain things, even being allowed. I think being in some like rooms with people or meetings with people, it just felt like if you weren't, one of her friends or a friend of a friend, you weren't heard as much in things. And even sharing some personal things with the company, it just some, to some people, it didn't feel like like you're kind of just wasting time, like cool, great on to the next person. Um, So I I just never really felt that you can sit with us. Mm -hmm. And I think other people felt that too. I actually... (laughs) I did a little bit of research on this before we started talking oh, yeah, and, yeah. and um, I, I went to the glass door and there was um, a new review and somebody said something very similarly, which I was like, I wish I knew who that was so I could talk to them. <laughs> but um, yeah, they felt the same thing that there was kind of like this in crowd. Um, and I mean, specifically for leadership, there was because it was all of Rachel's friends. Um, and then some people that it came it's like if you weren't her friend or you didn't come from, um, I don't, were they located previously, like LA? Yeah, I think um, LA, yeah. If you weren't from that, then you were you were kind of not in the circle. You weren't in the end club. Um, and everybody else was just kind of like doing work while they got to be who they were. They got to be themselves in the face of, you know, whatever they were doing, kind of. 
That's interesting because I know that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about from the email that you first sent me, which said management was only made up of Rachel's friends who were all yes men and did not have a background or experience in the roles we were given and that your boss would take you off of projects that were that were part of your main job description and instead put you just on a different project because of whatever. I just I was wondering how that level of whether nepotism or incompetence of management, how did how did that come into play? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, obviously, I don't know the reasons why that was done, but it was, it did seem like there were people who had a lot of experience in certain areas that were very quickly taken off of certain things um, to either move it to new people that were hired, that were her friends, or to just have them learn more things. What are some of the things that we've done? And also, this is kind of a weird question, but how did I as a leader instill that in you? I went from a social media coordinator to the marketing manager to brand partnerships to honestly, you name it, I did it. <laughs> um, this is my favorite thing about Rachel is she's like, I have an idea. <laughs> and so I just grab my paper and my pen and I'm like, okay, I'm ready. Whatever you want to do, we'll do it. Let's build a new website, all the things. She's like, oh no, you can do it. You, you know, you can build a website, it's fine. <laughs> I'm like, great, I'm gonna learn how to code. I'm gonna get with the developer and do all the things. They, they went from like a social media person to um, a manager of a brand, which that is amazing growth. And that, I watched that actually before I accepted the job and I just thought that that was um, really great that they had, you kind of had that freedom to grow into what you wanted to. But how it was in practice was that um, I think she actually calls that per Rachel calls that person her child. So D, give it up for D, guys. Mm. So D is um, one of my favorite children. Um, yeah, Lydia I thought Rachel that was weird. She's like, "This is my favorite child," and I was like, yeah. "Okay, that's weird." <laughs> yeah, I imagine so, it was a joke, but <laughs> still kind of an infantilizing way to frame someone who's a professional. Yeah, yeah, especially if you, yeah valued them to raise them to that level. But I think that was kind of just a testament that because she liked her and she saw her growing, she gave her these opportunities um, where she might not have had, you know, even in that video, she was saying, I didn't know how to build a website. So I had to learn all this stuff quickly. While similar things happened when I was there where we had people on staff who could do those things, but it was given to somebody else. Um, it just so seems it was, so wildly inefficient. Like, when I hire people to do things for my company, it's like, I'll hire someone to do the website because they're like, here's my experience with coding. I'll hire someone to write web content because they're like, here's my experience writing web content. I wouldn't just switch up people's roles for that because that uh, the role would be, it would t take longer for someone to learn a new thing. And also you wouldn't be getting the person with experience to do. I just don't understand the logic of that at all. And I think, I think the logic behind it was so we could gain experience in other mm -hmm. things, which again, I think is great. And yeah when I first heard that I was excited about it, but in practice, what I was doing was so far removed for what, from what I was passionate about, super experienced in that, that part in itself was just kind of like, I don't feel like I'm growing where I need to grow. And then the task that I was actually doing, I was very lost. And because I was specifically kind of in a leadership area, um, there wasn't anyone I could ask questions to. And while I think everybody Googles one or two things on the job, Googling how to actually do your full job is kind of a red flag that you might be in the wrong position or in that, you know, working on the wrong project. Um, so there wasn't really, and even when, yeah, questions were asked, there really wasn't an answer to be given because nobody really knew um, what was happening for certain things or they were working um, to find out what their actual project was. Um, another point that I wanted to make on that was um, another video where Rachel and Dave are actually talking about like how to work together as partners. Um, and I think Dave is the one that says, like they're speaking based on partners, but I think it's great advice just in general for a company is like knowing your strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. um, and working to that. And, you know, making sure that you minimize like working like strictly in your in your weaknesses. First piece of advice would be to 
understand your strengths and frankly your weaknesses and stay in a lane that maximizes your strengths while minimizing the chance that your weaknesses can get in your way. So for us, like, I'm more practical, I am more of an operator, you're more creative, you're more of a dreamer. I thought that was great on the video, but it was definitely the opposite of how things were practiced. Yeah, I to an extent, I can definitely understand the benefit of wanting people to get experience working on different projects and not wanting to say, oh, you were just going to do this exact job forever and never have the chance to grow. I think that's a good philosophy, but I think there's got to be a balance. It was just, we need, we need this type of project done and we need it done sooner than soon. Um, we were also working at very breakneck speed at things that we sometimes had never done before, which um, was just a pressure cooker of of um of an environment i'll admit it i'm the kind of person who used to love this kind of hyper positivity overly excitedness hyper extroversion at work all the time it took me a long time until i was in my mid-20s maybe to realize that this isn't something that everybody likes and that different people's preferences at work should be respected Thank God I wasn't running a company with employees at that point. As you guys know, I'm a really, really extroverted person. I'm the kind of person who wants to be around other people at all times. I've talked about in the past how like my ideal living situation would be if we could like replicate the college dorm environment and just live in that forever. Or if I could live in like a community co-working space. I know that that's weird, but like, I, I do not like not being around other people at all times. Filming this video right now is even a little lonely, except for that, like, I know that other people are gonna be listening to it, so I feel a little bit like I'm connecting with people. But anyway, I used to really seek out jobs where everybody was so hyped all the time. We all just want, wanted to talk to each other. We wanted to be best friends. We wanted to do things like have dance parties in the middle of the day, or when someone made a sale to put on a song and everyone stopped what they're doing and get up and dance around. I used to love that kind of shit. That is until I realized how much those tactics are used to manipulate emotional loyalty to a company from an employee. So back when I was 23 years old, I worked for a company that I hated. I'm not going to name it because I didn't wouldn't get my severance if I talked badly about them. And at 23, I really needed that $200 that got taxed to shit. Anyway, I worked for a company I hated. It was a salaried position position with benefits. However, I noticed a lot of parallels to a lot of the cult type of rhetoric I've seen in MLMs. So that'll be another video for another day where I delve into that. This company was a place which sounds a lot like Hollis Company in the sense that if something happened, everyone was expected to react, to dance together, to get up and jump up and down, to cheer with each other, to sing along to things together, to go to company outings with each other. And while I really thrived in that kind of environment, even though I hated the job, like the job itself sucked and I could tell that what they were doing after a while was like trying to get me emotionally invested so that I would stay at a company that I hated. And then I was actually like, bye, I'm gone. Goodbye, everybody. I'm never seeing you again. But still, I enjoyed that. It was only later on did I look back and realize that's kind of weird. And through developing a sense of empathy as an adult and making friends with a lot of really introverted writers or making friends with a lot of people who are a little more low energy or low key or more chill kinds of people, I started to realize, hey, this might not be what everyone wants at work. And because of that, maybe you need to adapt to each employee's strengths. It's because the Hollis Company was such an environment built on positivity, this employee felt that really speak up and say like, hey, I don't really like the dance parties or like, hey, I don't really want to be a part of this. I just kind of want to do my job. She didn't really feel comfortable in that environment because of the culture that was cultivated around positivity. While positivity was used for company morale, there were also times that she felt that positivity wasn't allowed in certain situations when it interfered with workflow. The example that she's going to talk about here involves the launch of the Rise workout app. And the last thing I think that I thought was really kind of confusing just in terms of like having that choose joy attitude and also wanting to celebrate the team. Um, it was something that um, we were kind of very good at doing um, the year prior, but when we got into COVID, not so much, just hearing um, that we were trying to move away from a launch mentality. And that translated um, to not celebrating 
whenever we finished a project or launched something. So when we put, um, like when the app came out, that we weren't allowed really to even like on our mess on our company messaging, like have like celebration tags or like congratulate we could congratulate the team but even like over excessively like I'm so proud of you for getting this thing done that you had never done before um that was not encouraged which was Weird. really strange because yeah and it was a, like choose joy be positive message but then if you want to be positive with someone they're like no stay on your task yeah so it was it was very strange to yeah feel like we were in the trenches together with certain things. And we've just, you know, we launched a, an app when we were, we had our heads down for six weeks in something and to get really excited about that. And it was like, let's try not to say too much about this. And I don't know, I don't know why that happened. I've, I've never heard that from any other company that I worked with. And it's not something that um, I continued to do afterwards um, because I think, companies should be excited no matter what happens with it to have accomplished something. Absolutely. Um, so that was, I think that was another hit for me, just like from a culture perspective of wanting to um, connect with other employees a little bit more and just feeling discouraged in that. Now, all of this might not seem like that big of a deal because, hey, different companies are going to have different philosophies. If you don't like the positivity of one company, you can find another one that has a completely different environment. However, there was a much larger problem going on at Hollis Company this entire time, and that was the lack of communication among different levels of people, whether that was from Rachel herself down to management, down to the staff below them, or communication between middle management and other staff members and nowhere was this lack of communication and lack of transparency more apparent than in the situation where Rachel Hollis was caught plagiarizing a quote from Maya Angelou. So let's talk about plagiarism and how it contributed to a lack of communication in company culture. About a year ago now, I did a video about Rachel Hollis plagiarizing Maya Angelou. As you guys know, I've been really upset every time I've noticed her plagiarizing because I'm an author myself, and the idea of having my work stolen is always a fear that I think every writer has. To see someone one who is a successful writer, who is constantly hitting bestseller lists and being touted as a genius and an expert in her time, making so much money and gaining so much clout off of plagiarized work is really upsetting when you're a writer. I did a video all about her plagiarism in the book Girl Stop Apologizing. I did a video about where she was sued by Mana Co of the Mana for Life company. However, I think the instance of her plagiarizing Maya Angelou where she took the quote, still I rise, and put it on her Twitter and put it on her Instagram was the most egregious of all of these. And the reason for that is that she basically took a quote from a poem and the title of a book of collection of poems, she took that phrase, which was related to civil rights and to overcoming systemic racism, and she made it about her own brand, capitalizing RISE like she does for her RISE conferences. A lot of people felt that she was appropriating the struggles of a lot of women of color in the United States and using it to market and further her own brand for profit, which felt very scummy in a lot of ways. I will link in the description below a bunch of videos by some fantastic creators who covered this very, very thoroughly. Now, if you guys remember when Rachel was caught plagiarizing from Maya Angelou, the apology that she posted was the exact opposite of what an apology should actually be. She never once said, I'm sorry for plagiarizing. She never once detailed what she'll do better in the future. Instead, she said that she felt bad that it happened, but claimed that she was not the one to do it, that her social media team was the one to post it. Now, if you are the head of a company, you shouldn't be publicly bashing your own employees. I'm a smaller business owner than Rachel is. I've only ever hired about five-ish people. I've never, just to be clear, I've never had someone on a W-2 type of payroll. I've hired 1099 employees, contract employees. However, all of that is irrelevant because do you know how many times I have publicly shit-talked them? 
Zero. Because that's not what you do when you're a boss and when you're a leader. I had heard rumors going around that Rachel had fired her social media manager after this happened. And that after this happened, the woman that she fired was actually a woman of color herself. So I decided to ask this employee for some further details around this entire situation and what really happened behind the scenes. I know that that was not handled from everything I've heard that wasn't handled very well on a, a company level, but I haven't yet had everyone had someone to ask about the details of that story and what exactly happened. So can you kind of let me know what 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 did go on there with the the post with still I rise and all of that? Yeah, and I can definitely talk about like my personal perspective of it. And then also some of the other people, um, some of the other employees that I worked with. Um, I was, you know, friends with a lot of um, some of the like black staff and other people of color there. Mm -hmm. And I feel like their perspective was definitely different than the rest of the company. Okay. Um, but overall, it was like for people who weren't on that specific team or knew exactly what happened or didn't even like follow Rachel to see the post, did not hear about the situation at all. Um, even in terms of, you know, the person who allegedly posted it um, and what that looked like. And I personally don't even think I realized that they had been let go until at least a week afterwards. And the way that it was presented to us was very um, like brushed under the rug in the way. And I, I personally feel that it's something that we could have like, that could have been an opportunity for the whole company to kind of come together and just talk about it. So that way it was transparency internally. Again, that was something that was expressed to me when I first started working there that, you know, over communication and things like that. Um, and of course, we didn't all need to know like the nitty gritty about it. But if there is something being said about a certain company and like we are, you know, instead of us speculating certain things as as employees, it would have been good to know certain things that had happened and how we can also support this person who just lost their job that we've been so connected with. Um, and then from the other employees, just about it being a Maya Angelou post specifically, um, I know that so, like some of their specific managers were asking them certain things, like how do they feel about it? And it also didn't really feel like a space where they could speak up still and share how they really felt about it. The way that it was even presented was kind of like, you're fine with this, right? Instead mm. of like really explaining, like wanting to hear why some people would have thought this was damaging. Of course, we can't all listen to, you know, certain negative comments that are said about us, but maybe that's a way to, hey, maybe we do need to see a different um um, perspective on this and have the opportunity to learn, but it didn't seem like when they were asked those questions that that was the intent of asking it. So I know that um, I have been hearing around the time that this, this plagiarism happened with Maya Angelou and the Still I Rise post and all of that, I'd heard a lot of rumors that the social media person who had been responsible for posting it had gotten let go of the company. So that that was true. That did happen. That did happen. And I think that was also something that like Rachel even mentioned. Um, I think that was mentioned on a post. I can't quite remember, but um, I think that was, yeah, a known situation that occurred. And I don't know if this is something you can reveal or not, but is it true? This is another thing I heard. Is it true that the person who was let go was a woman of color? That is something that I can confirm. Um, I think that person did also post about it. Okay. Um, but yes. Okay. But, and yeah, and I personally, again, I'm not sure what actually occurred if they did post it or not, but yes. Mm -hmm. so yes. Okay. Okay. I know that what you, when we talked over email before this call, when we were talking about the Maya Angelou um, plagiarism situation, the word you used was gaslighting. So I was... Um, kind of wondering what were some of the ways that you felt that the the staff at the company had you know engaged in uh, whether it was Rachel or her other people who how did people really engage with the concept of gaslighting regarding um, that was it regarding the, the plagiarism or the woman who was fired or how what what kind of happened there with the with the gaslighting yeah I think it was just like the situation as a whole just not letting us in on what actually happened definitely shifting the blame or not like 
it was just a lack of information. And also when it came to, you know, those like bringing this to the employees of color and wanting their opinion, the way that those questions were kind of directed at them was done in a way in which they didn't really want their feedback. And it was almost like pressure to Mm -hmm. not really like, like definitely don't say anything to anybody else. Like you can tell me if you want, but also there wasn't, it didn't feel like a safe space for them to say anything. Um, And that's just from like, you know, the few things that I talked to them about, about it. But even then it was hard to like talk to other employees about it, not even in a gossipy way. Um, It's just, it is stressful as an employee to be in a space that something like that can happen, especially in like she has, there are videos posted where it's like, it's okay to fail. That was also our culture that it's okay to make mistakes. And then this was an example of it definitely not being okay. So I know that one thing that, that really bothered me as an outsider, as a viewer, when I saw this happen was when the apology post went up, Rachel really didn't take any responsibility for it. She really didn't take any accountability for what happened with the plagiarism there. Um, at, at, at the office, did she take any accountability in the in the workplace for that? Or was it blamed all on this one woman who was let go? Yeah, so that's one of the things that we were not, um, we didn't hear from her on that. Oh. It was... Yeah, so the the situation was never addressed in a company-wide setting. It was um, in smaller groups that we got limited information, I think, like a week after it happened. Um, so even, yeah, what, what we were supposed to know f- was very limited, and um, we didn't get any information from the top on it. So she she didn't address it with the employees at all, really. No, not from not not at the level um, that I was at, at least. So the pandemic did not start off strong for the Hollis company. From a difficult rise virtual conference to the entire plagiarism scandal to Rachel and Dave announcing their divorce, things were not going well for an event-based company in a time of overall social distancing and lockdown. During the pandemic, one type of relief offered to companies in the U.S. was called a PPP loan. Right now, we are on the website ProPublica, which is describing the PPP PPP loan right here. Companies and nonprofit organizations that receive PPP loans may have the loans forgiven if they meet certain criteria, including not laying off employees during the defined period covered by the loan. Applicants must attest in their application that the loans are necessary for continuing operation. I actually did not apply for a PPP loan during the pandemic, and the reason for that is that I don't have employees on W-2 payroll, and a lot of the things that I was losing money for were not related to paying people's salaries or paying people's hourly rates or paying people's per project rates or whatever. The purpose of the PPP loan was so that employers wouldn't feel financially pressured to lay off or fire employees during the pandemic when they were making less profit. The entire purpose was so that they would have that money there as a safety so that they could pay their employees and people wouldn't have to worry as much about job security in a very insecure and uncertain time. The Hollis Company received quite a large PPP loan. Here it is right here, the Hollis Company. They received a PPP loan of almost $1 million, of $998,700. Of that loan, it's broken down right here how much of it went to payroll and how much of it went to utilities. Now, I just want to be very clear that I am not trying to claim in any way, shape, or form that I think the Hollis Company used their PPP loan incorrectly. I don't think that's true, and I would have no evidence to back anything like that up. So I'm not saying that whatsoever. I do believe that they probably applied for the PPP loan in good faith, paid it to their employees, and didn't lay people off during that particular period of time. The key word is during that particular period of time. On TikTok, we have a wonderful channel called Heather the Lawyer. And on this channel, this woman, Heather, who is an attorney, has talked a lot about what's been going on with Hollis Company and what has been going on with everything related to Rachel Hollis and all the updates around everything from her perspective, both as a lawyer and as a former fan of Rachel and her type of motivational rhetoric. 
I'm going to play the TikTok that Heather posted about the PPP loan, and then I'm going to read to you guys some of what she told me because I wanted to know her opinion on this as well. So, did the Hollis company get a PPP loan? Yes, they did. So here at the top, this is uh, ProPublica, I think is the website, but it confirms their loan amount was for almost a million dollars. Payroll constituted about $750,000 of that. So that's an eight week time frame of employees payroll. It averaged out to be somewhere around $70,000, $72,000 per employee, which max matches up with some other information I'm gonna give you in a second. So you can see all the other information lines up. It's in Austin, Texas. It's a marketing consulting services business, and they had 67 jobs reported. And it was approved on April 13th, and at the bottom, it's cut off. It says it's been fully distributed. Recently, we heard from one of Rachel's Instagram posts, I believe, that they're now down to somewhere around 20, 25 employees. So that's some interesting information since last year. I asked Heather what her thoughts were about all of the layoffs that happened, even in that video she mentioned right there, that the company is now down to about 25 employees when they used to have employees, when they used to have over 60 employees before the pandemic started. She said the loan was specifically for eight weeks of payroll and theoretically would have been used by October and it was specifically calculated by actual payroll expenses, so there was little room for elevation of incomes. Also, it only allowed for salaries up to $100,000 a year so that owners couldn't use it for their own inflated salaries. But when she came out, she also hosted a virtual conference that she made millions from. Also, banks were incentivized to give bigger businesses money. My bigger issue truly is she is the brand and her actions affect employees. Her actual lack of self-awareness has affected the lives of people that worked for her past and present. So like I was saying before, I'm not saying that she used the loan incorrectly. The loan ran out around October. However, as we're going to see here, October was when all of the layoffs began to happen. So let's talk about the layoffs. The employee that I interviewed was laid off in October along with a lot of other people from Hollis Company. Because Hollis Company was operating virtually at this time, the layoffs happened over a combination of a Zoom call and an email, and the way that it all happened seemed very, in my personal opinion, insensitive. So I am going to play for you guys an audio recording of what it sounded like when Rachel laid everybody off. You know, for those of you who are with us back in March, uh, I stood in front of you and I said that we would fight with everything we know how to do. Um, and we have fought for nine months. But a big part of our revenue comes from live events. Um, the most of our revenue comes from live events and we have pivoted and pushed and um, tried everything, but we can't continue to hold a staff at this size without being able to do events. Now I want you to know that I've tried, um, sorry, everything. And we have a leadership, as a leadership team, has fought so hard. And I know that you guys have worked so freaking hard with us. Um, we're going to take care of you and we're going to help you find the next thing. And we are going to be here to support you as a leadership team. And um, I want you to know that I do not take this lightly. I hope that you know um, what it is meant to me to be a leader for you guys. Um, and well, I'll carry this um, disappointment in myself for a really long time. And I'm going to work so hard to make sure that we can go back to the place that we need to. But um, I wanted you to hear it from me. When I first heard that, I replied to this person's email by saying, wow, just wow in all caps. Honestly, this reminded me of, have you guys seen It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia where the character Dennis carries an onion around in his pocket so that he can make himself cry whenever he wants to? Guys, I don't know if Rachel was really wanting to cry or not, but the point is, crying when you're about to destroy someone else's life is incredible 
incredibly unprofessional. It reminds me of a drunk-ass 19-year-old savvy about to break up with someone, and I'm crying the entire time about how much it hurts me when I'm the one about to break someone else's heart. That is just insensitive, dude. By the time that you're a 38-year-old multi-million dollar business owner, you should know not to do that. In my opinion, true empathy is not about showing that you understand other people's feelings through crying at them. It's about being able to interpret what other people are going to need at that time. Have you guys ever heard the term emotional labor, right? We often hear how, you know, when someone messes something up and they start profusely apologizing and going, oh my god, I'm so sorry, I'm such an idiot. The other person, the person who was wronged in the first place, often feels that the burden is now on them to do emotional labor because they have to go, oh no, it's okay, and now they feel responsible for having to mitigate the situation, and that is an undue emotional burden on them because they were the one who had something bad happen to them in the first place. My point here is, Rachel, when you're laying people off, this isn't about your feelings. So, girl, stop fake crying. Girl, stop rubbing onions on your face. As Ben Shapiro would say, onions don't care about your feelings. That's a throwback to when I made onion soup on this channel and the onion made me cry. But beyond the fake crying, there was also a bigger issue with the way that the layoffs were handled so quickly and so rapidly. And on top of that, with the way that Rachel promised, if you heard in the clip, she promised that she was going to be there for people as a source. Well, according to the person that I interviewed, after this layoff happened, she never heard from Rachel again. Let's listen to her entire story. So I know that there were, you even sent me some audio, there was uh, big layoffs that happened a couple months ago. And I mean, I, I want to hear a little bit about that just based on the fact that someone also had sent me evidence that the company had received a very large um, loan, one of the COVID relief loans, I think, uh, payroll loans, right? The payroll <laughs> protection ones. They got a very large payroll protection loan to keep employees on, yet it seems like there were still a whole bunch of layoffs that happened. So what happened there? How did the, like, how did the whole layoff thing go? Especially listening to the audio you sent me, like, She's crying during the layoffs, very unprofessional. But <laughs> anyway, I want to hear from your perspective what the what that whole process was like. I so again, I'm not sure if it was just my um, department or if it was I don't know, but I did not know about the loans that we received. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if that was a company wide thing that we didn't know or it was just me missing an email. Um, but it was, it was a very quick, um, it was a very quick thing that happened and I had not been through one before, so I'm not sure what the process is like anyway. It was just the way it was handled. I wish there had been, um, and HR was very like polite and, and great at following up and and talking to us individually after our emails went out, letting us know if we had been um, let go or not. Mm -hmm. And it was just from the, from the um, conversation that we had company wide that um, I shared um, to the, the immediate email. And then within by 5 PM that day, um, all email shut off, um, not able to, you know, like quickly scrambling to get anybody's um, phone number if we'd only been communicating internally. It just felt very cut off and and um, isolating immediately. So um, it was like the layoff happened that day and then it was just done that day? Yes. There was no like your job will end in, in a week or two or it was just like you're you're laid off, you're gone, goodbye. It was different for some people, but for me, it was 5 p.m. Turn in your computer by the end of the week. Oh, my um, God. And just to, and I will say that um, the, like, HR who was helping me was was following up with me and was saying, if you need anything, if you need um, a reference, even other employees were saying, I will go and write a review for you on LinkedIn if you want, whatever you need. But that was after the company wide meeting, I, I never heard from Rachel about anything. And not that 
I need someone to call me and make sure I'm okay um, with that decision. I understand this business. I completely understand why they happened in the first place. Um, it was just a, a very stark difference from the community um, that we had built as a company, um, even calling us um, family, even though she still explicitly says, even though we work together and she loves all of us, we're not friends. Like, she I said you're not that. friends? Is that a thing she said to you? That's that's what she says. That's what she said to the whole company. Like, she said, I'm not I, your friend? <laughs> yes. Yes. That's rude. So, I get so, that's how people want to like do the whole, like, I don't mix my professional and personal life. And that's yes. fair if you want to have those lines. I'm just, I think I'm an outlier. I'm too friendly of a person. Like once I've talked to someone like twice, we're friends in my mind, but maybe that's yeah. not the same for everyone. And yeah. And I, and I, I understand that you want to separate that and to say we're family, but we're not friends is, is a mixed that's message. And yeah. So when it's it like, happened, do you want to separate the professional life? It's like, if we're family, it seems like you don't want to separate it. But then if you're like, oh, we're not friends, though, it seems like you do want to separate it. So it's kind of, how do you know how comfortable to get in that environment then? Yes, yes. It's the, it's the we're not friends, sis. So I oh, don't. Oh, Lord. <laughs> so it was very, yeah, very confusing. And, and like I said, there was no reach out. And again, that's not something that I ever really think is required. But based on the culture that they were trying to grow, to be immediately cut off like that um, was was a surprise. It was definitely a surprise. So the audio that you sent me from the layoffs, was that from a Zoom call? Yes. Okay. So she did a Zoom call. I mean, when she was like, because she was t turning the, the emotion, uh, the emotional manipulation up to 100. That's what it felt like to me. It didn't, like, maybe it was genuine. I can't read someone's mind to know, but it it just listening to it to me felt very self-centered because you're, you're not the one who's about to lose your job. So who cares about your emotions right now? You know, yes. that's kind of how it felt to me. I guess when you were the one listening to that call, what did that feel like? The same. I, that's, that was me. I, we had gotten an, an invite to the meeting, I think about 45 minutes prior. So I already knew, um, just based on like the things I was working on being left off of certain, um, you know, meetings before like the week or two before. Um, so it wasn't necessarily like a surprise in, ger in general for me. Um, but the way the call was handled, I think if you didn't know, um, that definitely would have been um, a strange way to be told. And just also like, from a leadership perspective, I think it can, it's definitely hard. I, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to know what it feels like to have to do something like that. Um, but I think there are times as leaders that we really need to show strength and that's one where it needs to be done. And um, it just almost felt like I should reach out to her afterwards and, and comfort her. Right. Which is weird. Like, because she's not the one who just lost a job. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It, it, even in the calls, I mean, in that recording, she specifically said, like, I will still keep in contact with you. I'll still be here for you guys. But you never heard from her again. No. So she was lying, it seems like, <laughs> allegedly. Yeah. Okay. Well, that just seems like a, a terrible way to handle the whole situation, especially with how quick it sounds. You, from what you said, it was like 45 minutes, you're invited to a Zoom meeting, you get the Zoom meeting. Oh, people are getting laid off. We'll email you to tell you if you're laid off, you get an email. And then at the end of the day, it's like end of today, your email account's gone. Like that's really fast. I've never, yeah. I've never run a huge company. So maybe, maybe at a bigger, also that company was not like huge though. Right. It was like, what, like 60 employees at the time. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, there's no reason with that number of employees, you can't do a more personal thing one-on-one -on -one with people. That's not that many people when it comes down to it compared to the like 2 million people following you on Instagram. That's yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And that's really how it felt to me. Well, I'm really sorry you had to deal with that. Um, I hope your new work situation is much better. Yes, I'm doing much better. With all of these things happening, with the layoffs, with the entire company being in a difficult place with the pandemic, the PPP loan running out, all of the mess that was facing this company, 
that was also facing many other companies during the pandemic, hosting live events like the Rise Weekend was difficult. Compounding on that, as we saw the other week in my last video, Rachel burned a lot of bridges with a lot of people through the infamous TikTok that she posted about the woman who cleans her toilets and how she wants to be unrelatable. Well, after all the backlash that she received from that, a lot of speakers started dropping out of the Rise Conference lineup. As a result, the Rise Conference, which was originally supposed to happen about a month from now, will now be happening Labor Day weekend. Here we have the new Rise website, as you can see right here. It will be happening Labor Day weekend of 2021. It talks about things to get you inspired. Now, we have getting your ticket. The tickets are still the same hyper expensive prices. Let's take a look at the postponement details, and then I'm actually going to girl start apologizing for a mistake that I may have made in a previous video. So it says, when is the conference being pushed to? September 4th, 2021. Why is the conference being moved? In an effort to genuinely grow and learn from experience, the content of this event too must change. And in order to show up authentically for you, it will take some time to get this right, which is why we are postponing the event until September. And now the speakers will be changing as well. There is no current speaker lineup listed, again, because a lot of the speakers have dropped out of this conference. Now, a couple weeks ago, I talked about the Rise Live Virtual Women's Weekend Conference, and when I talked about it, I made it seem like having a conference virtually costs a lot less to put on than having a conference in person. And I did truly believe that at the time. And on top of that, I think that as a consumer, a lot of consumers are much more willing to pay more for an in-person conference because you want to do the networking, you want to get to meet other people, the experience is just a lot more valuable. However, I actually had someone reach out to me over email after that who does work in event planning and conference management and that type of thing. So I just want to briefly give everyone an overview of what hosting a virtual conference might entail just to let everyone know that I apologize. I think I did get it wrong when I said, oh, it's going to cost so much less. That was based on my limited experience, and I definitely don't work full-time in professional event planning or event management, so I'm appreciative that someone who knows a lot more about it told me this, so let's talk. Uh, this person, first of all, said, you know, a disclaimer, Rachel Hollis's prices are undoubtedly not worth the product price, but having helped run and support two virtual conferences in the last three months, the price to set up these conferences is about equal to in-person events. So then this person broke down some of the different costs involved, including first the platform, Conferences, conference platforms can range widely in quality and cost for a three day conference and about 2000 expected atten attendance, a bare bones platform like Whova, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, could cost about $15,000 and that does not include the Zoom licenses. On the high end, a much prettier and more useful platform like Cvent will cost about $40,000 minimum. Platforms like Open Waters, which are more popular for these kind of events, can easily be $75,000 plus. So I didn't realize that hosting it on certain virtual platforms would cost as much basically as renting out a big event space. That was new knowledge to me and I greatly appreciate this person letting me know. Overall, the Rise Conference has really said a lot about Rachel as a leader and the way that she ran her company and her overall leadership skills. The employee that I interviewed actually sent me some clips and some video from the Rise Conference and pointed out a couple of things. One thing was there was a woman at this conference named RC who was an employee of Rachel's as well and a member of the team. RC, whose actual name is Rachel, but when I hired her, I said there can only be one of us. Uh, so we changed, literally changed her name to RC. That sounds like Devil Wears Prada. Um, so she's our head of product. <laughs> In that clip, Rachel jokingly says, you know, when I met RC, I heard that her name was Rachel too, but we could only have one Rachel, so I made her change her name. I thought maybe that was a clever inside joke or something, just something funny between friends. But according to this employee, uh, no, that really happened. They, she did really, uh, and now I don't know if maybe this person was just comfortable with it, but like, it's a little weird. Additionally, based on the changes to the Rise Conference that we're seeing now and the fact that Rachel is focusing so much on the idea of learning and growing and trying to be better, a lot of people have been speculating that this might be around the area of diversity and cultural sensitivity and, I don't know, not being a racist asshole who thinks it's normal to compare your girl boss hustle culture life to the likes of someone like Harriet Tubman. I mean, that's just common fucking sense for any, like, mildly 
not racist person out there, but I digress. We are now going to talk a little bit about the efforts of diversity training that have happened at the Hollis Company and how those turned out. The way that it was framed was, here are all the tragic things that have happened in Black history in America. And so that explains why people are mad that people are that Black people are getting shot by police right now. And if you need a class to be told why it is sad that Black individuals are being killed by police, I think that's already a bad start. Yeah. yeah. And for the for um, some of my friends who are people of color who are working there, it was very triggering to have, I think it was like two hours. It was over an hour um, thing that we did every day to have that in the middle of the day and just be reminded of, hey, the, you know, Tulsa massacres, all, you know, the civil rights movement and all of these terrible, tragic things have happened. Let's get back to work and have other meetings. That's a very like graphic thing to kind of talk about in the middle of your work day and then get back to it. Um, but that was, it was really just like, here are, yeah, terrible moments in history. That's why people are feeling bad now. That's what led up to this. And it's like, I think even you don't need to have that basic information of history to really understand how we can start impacting um, things today and join the conf the conversation today based on what is occurring right now on the news. There were times where you could ask questions, but it was never really like, how are you seeing certain things? Do you, you know, there was no real opportunity for them to have their voice heard um, or give them a real platform, which also seemed strange if we're talking about, you know, if we could have yeah. talked about, um, yeah, showcasing more, you know, Black people specifically or, or you know, hearing their stories. How could we uplift them? How would you like to see that? Um, that was not, um, that was not a part of the, the time at all. Now, before I go too deep into what this employee was saying about her experience with diversity training at this company, I wanted to let everyone know that this employee explicitly told me that she was comfortable with me telling everyone that she has a queer identity. She's part of the LGBT community. Like I myself, I didn't even feel comfortable enough to come out, even knowing that, um, you know, Brad and other members of the team were out. It still didn't feel like it, you had to be kind of like in an in crowd to truly be yourself. And that is something that she felt informed her overall experience at the Hollis Company. Additionally, when she talked to me about a lot of the experiences regarding the diversity training and the discussions of anti-racism at this company, she was talking a lot about specifically things that she knew that employees of color had felt during this time, including having a lot of employees who were people of color at this company feeling that the way Rachel and her company approached this was kind of forcing them to spend, take time out of their workday to relive elements of black trauma and black tragedy through a history lesson and then to be expected to just go back to their workday like nothing had happened. She also, as a queer woman, felt that the company had never really done anything to address diversity in terms of the LGBT community or specifically in terms of disability. Overall, all according to her and other employees of various marginalized identities at the company that she'd spoken to, the diversity training felt performative. Now for a final update of something that people have been messaging me about and telling me about, which is that Rachel Hollis has, I guess, been dropped from Target. And that seems to be accurate based on the fact that I went to Target's website over here and I searched for Rachel Hollis and... Dave is the only one that comes up. If you search for her Start Today journal, you get other journals from other people instead. Now, a lot of people are celebrating this, saying, oh my God, Rachel got her brand deal with Target terminated. This is showing that her accountability, she's truly being held accountable for things. I have mixed feelings, as I do about most things. Do I think that after Rachel has shown herself to be insensitive, narcissistic, racist, and abusive to employees, that she should be having a successful line at Target? No, I honestly don't think she deserves it. However, I'm not gonna come out here and celebrate Target. 
target, guys. What kind of small business supporter would I be if I was out here like, yes, go woke target. Target is out here supporting marginalized community. Oh, fuck that, dude. Target is a big box corporation. Target is uh, one of those big companies that's driving out small businesses. That's it, It's a capitalist decision at the end of the day. They chose what would be most profitable for them. And we can see that based on the fact that they're keeping Dave. They're keeping Dave. And I don't want to hear anyone giving Dave a pass going, you know, oh, Dave's a good guy. He's doing so much better now that he's dating Heidi or whatever. By the way, everyone who's asked for my opinions on the fact that Dave's dating Heidi Powell, one, this is not a celebrity gossip channel, so... I was not going to make a video on that. This is a business and books channel. And two, I mean, he's got a type. What can I say? The man's got a type. It's cool. He's got a type. However, I've just, the Dave worship, I do not understand. I do not understand it. He is someone who was part of running this entire scam. He was part of a company that was funding speaking at MLM conferences. He was part of this entire ruse of running marriage conferences when his own marriage was failing. Dudes, Dave's a scammer too. He's just better at his own social media image because he was a Disney executive. He's just a better business person. Don't be fooled by Dave's white man capitalist ass, okay? Don't be fooled by Dave. So what can we learn about leadership and about running a successful company from the mistakes that have happened at Hollis Company along the way? You, I mean, you reached out to me, I think, after... I posted my recent video about the whole mess she had on TikTok. So I guess what either what were your thoughts on that or what about what about it made you inspired to want to reach out to me and share your experience? Um, yeah, what 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 was uh, what caused all of that? Yeah, I think um, your videos definitely got me through like a lot of last year. Oh, really? Um, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I really wanted. I wanted to just share a little bit about the employees and, and truly how dedicated we are um, or some of us were to the work um, because a lot of the messaging that people get about the employees is just, it, it paints a picture of, I don't think like how we really were um, just in that, like there's mistakes left and right and this and that, but it re we really were doing a lot of amazing things at almost breakneck speed. And so I, wanted to kind of just speak up for the people I worked with and the people that are there now and just say that they really are some of the most incredible people that I worked with, even in times where I didn't feel like I could fully step into myself and, and share that with them. Um, it wasn't for lack of, um, you know, just people working the hardest that I've ever seen, honestly. Um, I also really just really like your platform and, and how you try to tell a story. I know you add comedy to it, but even just like the things that you, that you share and how thoughtful you are about things. And, and I thought this would be a safe place to just share, share that story and just let people know that. And just like I'm standing up for the employees, you know, Rachel yeah, is also yeah. a real person. And, and I think what has happened the last uh, two weeks or whenever it started is, we're really just seeing somebody who is struggling in public, yes, um, yes. which is another really devastating thing. And that's, you know, everyone has their right to say whatever they want in her comments and things like that. And, and there are, you know, really damaging things that have, that have come from some of the things that she has posted. Um, but it, it's also really, um, it's really interesting to see what what it looks like to be in the public eye and not and not truly understand that impact um, or really understand what it means to be an influencer or or see that influencing people can be just as harmful as it can be positive depending on how you use it and I think that's something that she's learning and it she's learning it at a very hard time yes, with yes. different things that she's that she's going through um, so I. I, I just know that everyone over there is doing is doing so much. And I wish that it wasn't at the cost of of saying certain people are are doing their job wrong, that that the business can still continue and thrive if that's if that's what it needs to do. Um, but I do think that just really understanding what their 
what they're there for and what people need from that business and what they really shouldn't be doing. Some, some things, what, you know, how can events look different with new, with new people speaking up, um, you know, having actual professionals speak to certain points, those points that um, the audience members really come to hear um, rather than just saying, you know, like, I know I'm not an expert in this, but I want to do it. Um, really just challenging that and seeing how it can grow because if she does have this audience, if she does have this platform, then there, if all it takes is learning and, and getting through this to make something great, then that's amazing. Um, because there are still, I think, 25 people there that are working their hardest to do really good things. To help me along in this process, the wonderful person that I interviewed for this video sent me a couple of Glassdoor reviews from former employees. So on this, this review said, growth is a mindset. Pros, amazing work culture, incredibly talented colleagues, great travel opportunities pre-COVID. I truly loved coming into work every day. Cons. Growth is very much a carrot on a stick. You'll find that favorites get promoted quickly, sometimes without reason, while other departments claim it's simply not as easy or excuses are made. There is clear nepotism within the leadership team. Big dreams and lofty promises are made but not kept. Eventually, the pivoting can become dizzying for both employees and consumers. So this really goes along with something that she told me during our interview, which was that Rachel's friends often seemed to get all of the leadership positions and had the ability to make all of the decisions. And sometimes that resulted in a lack of productivity for the employees themselves, because a lot of times people who were specialized in a certain area might be taken off of a certain area just because one of Rachel's friends wanted to do that job instead, and people would get shifted around a whole lot. According to this Glassdoor review, it has cons. In my opinion, the things I observed as cons, lack of experience management, because a lot of hiring came from referrals to hire employees' friends, and then promote when others left or were laid off. In my opinion, there was an in-crowd. For example, some employees knew they were going to be let go and were given time to prepare, and people like me were blindsided when a meeting with operations was put on our calendar. I was drawn to the Hollis company because I thought it was going to be a very positive, empowering environment. I had very little interaction with Rachel or Dave ever, though they were pleasant when they were in the office. I thought employees might have access to coaching or workshops since we worked for two influencers, but we didn't receive that as benefit. That's a little strange. But this really does go along with and is very similar to what she told me during our interview, which is that... The company really felt like it had an in-crowd. It felt like it had people who were the cool kids at the company. Like Rachel always said, this company is about you can sit with us. This isn't the mean girl saying you can't sit with us. However, according to this employee, she did not feel comfortable becoming friends or forming relationships with other people because the environment really felt very clicky to the point where she didn't even feel comfortable being open about her queer identity at work. And that's one of the reasons she was comfortable with me talking about it in the video because that won't identify her since no one at work even knew that about her. So my fellow small business supporters, other women in business who might be watching this, what are some things that we can learn from this situation? I think a major important thing that we can learn from this situation is the importance of clear transparency with others in your company. This problem is not unique to Hollis Company whatsoever. While this is a, a problem that's relevant to talk about on my channel right now because I have been covering this story as it's been unfolding, this is a problem widespread in tons of companies, especially once they get to a certain size. Having clear communication, not just with your direct superiors or the direct people below you in a company, but having communication with everybody. And every time you want to work on something with someone, making sure they understand what's happening and why it's happening and making sure that nobody feels pressured to say or do something that they don't truly believe, whether that's something as simple as pressuring someone to dance during a company dance party or pressuring someone to pretend to be okay with someone getting fired for someone else's plagiarism. Regardless, I think it's important for everyone to be able to be open and honest with each other and to feel comfortable with that. And I know sometimes we can all get caught up in our work and we can forget that there are other people, but taking time to reflect on what you're doing and how it might be affecting your employees is incredibly important. That transparency also connects to when someone in your company is 
not going to be working for you anymore. If you have a salaried employee, a payroll employee, and you want to lay them off, well, maybe you need to give a two weeks notice or something. It, it just seems like overall, the takeaway here is it's important to be open and honest with everyone that you work with, especially if you are the one running that company. I think what may have gotten away from Rachel and what gets away from a lot of CEOs and a lot of business owners is that the company, while you might be the face of it and while you are going to get the experience the greatest victories and the greatest defeats based on what happens to the company the company is not exclusively about you if you're running a company because everything is about furthering your own dream and your own image then you need to remember that at the end of the day the other people involved aren't working because they have the same passion for your image and your life that you do they're working because they're passionate about what they do and they need to make a salary for their own families. So just remembering to make that empathetic connection to other people is incredibly important. And that's something that we really can't forget, especially as businesses are struggling in this pandemic. Like this employee said in the interview, at the end of the day, Rachel is a person and she is someone who had big dreams and who did set out to actually create something, but in the process seemed to lose sight of how the company should run and lose sight of what her initial goals were. It's important to remember to always tie things back to what is this company and if the company you're running doesn't have a clear mission to solidify that mission not just for your own sake but because there are going to be other people depending on you as well if you're going to change your company from a party planning business to a food blogging business to a cookbook business to a fiction book business to a motivational speaking business well along the way if people are getting laid off because of that or people are losing their jobs or people are feeling like they can't truly perform their best because your decisions aren't translating well to them, then it might be time for you to take a look at yourself and the way that you run your own company. This is advice that I'm giving to Rachel as well as every other business owner out there and you guys can take it or leave it because I know that my own company brings in a lot less money than Rachel's company brings in, even though, I mean, I feel like for a very small business, I'm doing pretty well. But watching this journey and hearing about how things worked on this scale, especially with another woman in business who might have been someone I could have looked up to in different circumstances if she had done a lot of things differently, it's really helpful to have her story and her mistakes to reflect on myself and keep me in check as a business owner and just as someone who cares about uplifting other women in business. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Please don't forget to check out the links in the description below, not only to my Patreon supporters, but also to my own Business Forever home friends and to the merch if you want the Life Happens 3U mug. It's a good time. I appreciate you guys all being here and for supporting my channel along the way. We hit 15,000 subscribers. Let me know what you guys want to do for for a celebration for that. In the meantime, though, please don't forget to support small businesses, and I will see you guys again on Monday. Bye, friends! Get you some nuts! There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should pick up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it. <laughs>